Hello people. Today I will be talking about, the Alaskan Tundra. Yes, I will be using this voice to narrate the whole time. But don't worry guys, it's not that long. Anyways. Alaska is like half tundra and half. Other stuff. It's also like stuck onto the side of Canada, but it's part of America. The top of Alaska is part of the Arctic Circle, so it's technically part of the Arctic Ecosystem too. But there's also the parts on the bottom and left that aren't part of the Arctic Circle. Well, with that out of the way, let's begin. The tundra is basically like a desert except snowy and cold. Very cold. The annual temperature is 18 degrees. That's like 4 times lower than what San Diego's normal temperature is. The tundra gets around 6 to 10 inches of precipitation, which is mostly snow or melting snow. But somehow there are a lot of little pools of water. This is because the permafrost blocks it from coming in. There are two main seasons. Summer and winter. In summer, the sun shines for almost 24 hours in a day. Summer lasts 50 to 60 days. But the temperature only gets up to about 40 to 50 degrees. In winter, the sun may not rise for weeks and weeks. Which makes it get super cold. There are still animals and plants that live there though. But many animals are, or are becoming, extinct. All those cars, and factories contribute to global warming, which is making the ice melt, and endangering the animals. I mean look at this polar bear. It's so sad. The funny thing is, one third of the world's soil carbon, which is carbon dioxide found in soil, is located under the tundra ice. So the more carbon dioxide is emitted, the ice caps will melt, and the more the ice caps melt, the more carbon dioxide will be emitted. But there are some solutions guys. If you use those cool electric cars, you can cut down on gas emitted. And if you use alternative energy sources in general, then that would be pretty helpful too. Now let's talk about cycles. I am going to talk about these four cycles. The phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon, and water. First is the phosphorus cycle. The phosphorus cycle is about how phosphorus circulates through plants, animals, soil, rocks and some other things. In some parts of the tundra, there is practically no rain, so they can't get their phosphorus from the rune off of rocks. So instead they get their phosphorus from animal waste, animals and plants decomposition and from the ocean, because of global warming, and humans doing stuff, and many other factors, the phosphorus level varies. Now for the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen, along with oxygen, are the most common molecules in the atmosphere, and we need to have both in our bodies to survive, but unlike oxygen, we can't directly use nitrogen. Nitrogen is taken from the atmosphere and certain bacteria turns it into a molecule called ammonia. This process is called nitrogen fixation. Ammonia can also be found in animal waste, and plant remains. But you cannot use this type of nitrogen molecule either, so a different bacteria has to come and turn it into nitrite. And since you can't use that one either, another bacteria has to come and turn it into nitrate. This nitrate can either go through a process of denitrification and go back to the atmosphere, or, it can be used by plants. Humans and animals eat the plants in order to get nitrogen. Here is a more accurate depiction of the nitrogen cycle in the tundra. Notice how in assimilation the nitrogen goes to the permafrost instead of plants. This is because the permafrost is like a wall that is relatively hard to penetrate. So the few plants that live there get nitrogen from having the roots in the permafrost, instead of getting it straight from the earth, if that makes sense. Now for the carbon cycle. He carbon cycles through four main places. Inside the earth, on the surface of the earth, in the ocean and in the atmosphere. Let's start with the ocean. The ocean takes in more carbon than it gives to the atmosphere. This is because there are plants inside the ocean that need to do photosynthesis. The animals inside the ocean eat the plants. The ocean gives the carbon back to the atmosphere through a process called air sea gas exchange, and also through the animals respiration. The rocks inside the ocean give carbon to the soil and rocks underneath them, which leads to the next place, inside of the earth. 
there is a bunch of carbon inside the earth. It is let into the atmosphere through soil respiration, volcanoes, and humans, who take out fossil fuels. The next place is the surface of earth. This is like where we are sitting right now. Humans and animals all use a process of respiration, which is basically breathing. But humans also burn a ton of fossil fuels, which led to there being a ton of carbon in the atmosphere. Just burning anything really can add carbon to the atmosphere, and the atmosphere, the final place, uses a process called air sea gas exchange to start the cycle all over again. Here is another more accurate depiction of the carbon cycle in the tundra. Last but not least is, the water cycle. This is pretty much a regular water cycle, so I won't go into too much detail. When the sun shines on the ocean, it makes the water evaporate and turn into clouds in the sky. Then when the clouds get big enough, the water, or if it's cold enough, which it normally is, the snow, will fall out of the clouds, or precipitate. Since it mostly snows, the snow accumulates, and eventually if it gets warm enough, the snow will melt. Once the snow melts, it will either just stay in a puddle, or find a river and flow to the ocean. The sun is also barely ever there, so the water in the ocean doesn't evaporate very often. This is why the tundra gets such low precipitation. Now for some natural disasters. The Alaskan tundra has three predominant natural disasters. Wildfires, earthquakes, and volcanoes. Alaska has the most earthquakes in the United States. This is because Alaska is right on top of two tectonic plates. Every 13 years or so, Alaska has an earthquake of at least 8 on a Richter scale. I mean look at that. It is almost the worst type of earthquake. Look at the damage an 8 earthquake did. So yeah, earthquakes are pretty bad. There are also volcanoes too. A lot of volcanoes. There are about 130 total volcanoes, and 70 of those are still active. Inactive volcanoes can be found in every region of the state. That's a lot of volcanoes. There are also fires. Now you're probably thinking, what? Fires? In a tundra? But it's supposed to be cold. Well, the tundra is really dry, since it like, never rains. So if lightning strikes or something, it could easily start a fire. Now for some animals. Here are some pictures of food webs and food chains. The top predators are owls, wolves, and polar bears. They are always at the top of the food chain. There are about 1,700 plant species, and only 48 animal species in the whole Arctic. There may not be many species of animals, but the number of animals is very high. The keystone organism for the Alaskan tundra is the lemming. Look at this thing. It's so cute. They weigh 1 to 4 ounces and are 3 to 6 inches long. Their fur is long and soft and they have really short limbs. The short limbs help them stay warm. They are mostly herbivores and sometimes eat bugs. But the food they eat is not very nutritious, so they have to eat a lot of it. They can spend up to 6 hours a day looking for food. Their lifespan is 1 to 3 years. They live alone most of the time and only interact with one another when mating. Then after that, they separate again. Lemmings mature after 5 to 6 weeks and they breed a lot. They may have 8 litters of up to 6 children just during one summer. The female's gestation period is 20 days. 
They live under the permafrost in a tunnel system to keep away from predators. They have little places underground for resting, bathroom, and nesting rooms. However, they do not hibernate. Every couple of years, the lemming population explodes so groups of lemmings will migrate somewhere else until the population returns to normal. They migrate every summer in search of food anyway. While there, they will also breed a lot, and in autumn they return. The lemmings are prey to a ton of predators. They reproduce a lot, so there is generally a lot of them. But many predators eat them, so the population stays relatively constant, besides the population bursts. But recently, the population bursts are becoming less constant and the population trend is becoming unpredictable. Because of global warming, the tunnels they live in will sometimes melt and drown them. This is bad for the ecosystem, I mean, they are the keystone organism after all. Because the population is getting so unpredictable, the predators have to find another source of food. So predators turn to things like birds. This could make the birds endangered. Lemmings are a threatened species, but not endangered. Alaska has a lot of abiotic resources. Some include oil, coal, and a lot of different metal ores. There isn't as much of this in the tundra areas though. Most minerals are found in central Alaska. Now for the final topic, energy flow. There are four main levels in a food chain. The primary producers, the primary consumers, the secondary consumers, and the tertiary consumers. The primary producers are plants or other things that do photosynthesis. The primary consumers get their energy from the sun. The primary consumers eat the producers. The primary consumers are normally herbivores or mostly herbivores. Then the secondary consumers. They eat the primary consumers and sometimes the primary producers. They can be omnivores or carnivores. Lastly, the tertiary consumers. The tertiary consumers eat the secondary and primary consumers and sometimes the primary producers. They can also be omnivores or carnivores. Fun fact, humans are tertiary consumers too. Anyways, energy is lost as the level gets higher. The energy decreases by 90% each time the level gets higher. This means that the higher the level, the more you have to eat to maintain your energy level. It also means that there are more producers than primary consumers, more primary consumers than secondary consumers, and more secondary consumers than tertiary consumers. This is because there is less energy available to the animals on the high level, so if the population was large, there wouldn't be enough food. There may be a bunch of humans, but since humans are omnivores, the food wouldn't run out so fast. But if we were just carnivores, or just herbivores, then there probably wouldn't be so many humans. Well, that's it guys. I hope you learned something. Here's the bibliography. Okay, bye.